One thing I want to do is give you a quote to start with from James Cash Penny himself, the founder of the J.C. Penny Company. And this quote came out in 1952, 50 years after he'd opened his first store in Kemmerer, Wyoming, and not long after his entire chain of stores, which at the time numbered almost 1,800 department stores, including more than 40 locations here in Montana, had collectively topped a billion dollars in sales. He was asked what his secret was of his success, and you can see what he says here. I'll read it to you for those of you in the back. We were all small town and country boys. It wasn't our way to invade small towns and villages out of the blue to make a quick cleanup, then disappear again into thin air, leaving people with empty pockets and nothing of value to show for their money. We were settling permanently as small town men born and bred who understood our neighbors as readily as they could understand us. And in coming among them to say, it was an idea beneficial to all. Now, I happen to come into this world <laughs> at a time when Baker, Montana had a J.C. Penney store just four blocks away from my place of birth at Fallon Memorial Hospital. And any time I've talked to people in my hometown about the very existence of this store, particularly those under the age of 50, they tend to look at me kind of funny and say, wait a second, you mean to tell me that Baker had a J.C. Penney department store? And I say, yeah, it did, beginning in 1927 all the way till 1972. And then they say, well, it must have just been a tiny catalog center. And I say, no, it was not. It actually was a full-scale department store with a full line of clothing for men, woman, and child, everything but furniture in order to make a house into a home. And of course, a farmer, a rancher, railroad worker, or oil field worker could walk into the store and not only buy quality workwear for hard labor, but a fedora hat, a three-piece suit, shirt, tie, and dress shoes for that night on the town and the Sunday morning service the next day. And what's fascinating to me is that the Baker store was not an aberration. Montana had 43 J.C. Penney stores at one time or another. In communities as, small, as large as Missoula, Billings, and of course Great Falls, but also on the contrary, on the main streets of Harlowton, Forsyth, and Conrad, as well as a host of others in between. Now what's fascinating beyond the personal aspects of J.C. Penney in Montana is the historical significance of this. Because from one store in Kemmerer, Wyoming, James Cash Penney has created a chain that's operated in the United States for 112 years and in Montana for almost 102. And as we look at the retail landscape today around Montana, which typically has nothing to do with the city centers and main streets, we can find that J.C. Penney is still among these postmodern competitors. I had to put a plug in for Murdoch's as a Montana-based chain now. But at the same time, we look at what has been in the 20th century and all the competitors that have gone by the wayside. And uh, sometimes there's a collective sigh when we see some of these names, particularly for me, uh, Hart Albin and downtown Billings. But to understand the J.C. Penney chain, you really need to understand James Cash Penney. And to understand James Cash Penney is to understand the concept of the golden rule. Penney grew up in northwest Missouri, just a few miles down the road from where former Senator Conrad Burns would grow up. And he made his way west in order to initially escape the risk of tuberculosis. He found himself working for these gentlemen. And if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a man named Tom Callahan. The upper left is James Cash Penny, and the far right is a guy named Guy Johnson. These guys were the founding people behind a merchandising syndicate called the Golden Rule. And their whole idea was, as the, chap as the verse in Matthew says, doing unto others as you'd have done unto you. James Cash Penny went to work for these gentlemen in Evanston, Wyoming in 1899 when he was merely 24 years old. But they had a profound influence on him and he began thinking of the idea of creating a chain of department stores at the most maybe 50 throughout what he called the Middle West. These stores would be based on the principles of the golden rule for the customer. For Penny that meant selling only quality merchandise at the lowest possible price. Now that does not mean selling the cheapest merchandise, because if it compromises quality, you're not doing unto others as you would have done unto you. 
At the same time, Penny felt that the people who came to work for his chain should have opportunities that were given to him. He had been very fortunate because under the guidance of Tom Callahan and Guy Johnson, he was given the opportunity to open his first Golden Rule store in Kemmerer, Wyoming. And the plan behind this is if Penny could come up with the one-third investment needed to open this location, Callahan would come up with the other third and Johnson would come up with the remaining third. And together the three businessmen would share the profits in that store. James Cash Penny believed that each store should be local in its service to the community. And it was important for the manager, at that point Penny himself, to understand the community, what its needs were, the merchandise that it required, the customer service that it deserved. This store was so successful that a year later he was able to move to this much nicer location, sandwiched between two saloons in Kemmerer on the Triangle. And in 1903, he was able to persuade his mentors to use their profits to open yet another new location in the mining camp of Cumberland, Wyoming. Penny had seen the damage that the company stores had done in this region. In particular, they sold on credit, and that was an incentive for them to basically get miners in debt to the store at higher prices. Any of you remember the Tennessee Ernie Ford song, 16 Tons? You'll know what I'm talking about. So as a moral rule, Penny felt that he needed to sell on a cash-only basis. It encouraged people to only buy what they need, but it also kept the prices low. He would buy his merchandise from New York for cash, he would sell it for cash. And that's a conviction that James Penny had all of his life, and I'll explain that long after J.C. Penny decided to start offering charge accounts. So by 1907, James Cash Penny was finally able to buy out Johnson and Callahan. And at that time, he had two locations. One is the current J.C. Penny store in Kemmerer, Wyoming, and the second was his location in Cumberland. What he decided to do was beginning to offer partnerships to people like himself in the same golden rule way that Johnson and Callahan had helped him out. So he began recruiting clerks into his firm. Many of them came from his hometown in Missouri. They made their way west for new opportunities initially in southern Utah or, su or southern Idaho as well as northern Utah. And I want to show you that when you think that he started with two stores in 1907, this photograph was taken five years later in 1912. And if we look closely, we can see James Cash Penny in this photograph as well as all of the other managers of the stores he had opened in those five years. He had gone from two stores to 32. And of particular note, you can see Penny in the lower left. In the upper right is his younger brother, Herbert Penny, who unveiled the first of Penny's stores in the state of Montana on Central Avenue in downtown Great Falls. Now these stores were still part of the Golden Rule Syndicate. So there were other Golden Rule proprietors, including Johnson and Callahan, that continued expanding their own chains. But Penny's chain was growing rapidly. His brother Herbert was so good at merchandising for Great Falls that he generated enough profits to open yet another new store two years later in downtown Kalispell. And you can see that it's still called the Golden Rule, but look slightly below that, 70 busy stores. In a two-year time frame now, they'd gone from 32 locations to 70 locations in 13 states. Penny had finally had to relocate from Wyoming to Salt Lake City, Utah. But as he was there, his senior partners increasingly began to pressure him to consider creating what would ultimately become America's first transcontinental department store chain. They felt that they needed to formally incorporate because the series of partnerships not only left the owners open to liability, unlimited liability, but it made it difficult for banks to respect them if they were going to actually try to become a national department store chain. So in 1913, they formally incorporated and they created what's called the Penny Idea. And the best way I can explain that to you was an early mission statement for what James Cash Penny wanted his company to do as it became a national department store. It had seven points, and every one of those involves the golden rule, both in treatment to the customer, to the community that a J.C. Penny store served, to the people who came to work for J.C. Penny, and last but most importantly, to test our every policy, method, and act in this wise. Does it square with what is right and just? 
His formula took off after the company relocated to New York City in 1914. By 1917, you can see there were 175 stores. By 1920, there were nearly 300. By 1926, 600 nationwide. But while the company was rapidly expanding across the nation, only five stores existed in the state of Montana. The two that he had opened with his brother in Great Falls and Kalispell, as well as additional partnered stores that he'd opened in Anaconda and Missoula, and a fresh brand new store in Red Lodge in the Pollard Hotel building. But that was it. And the reason for his forbearance across the state was largely based on Golden Rule as a philosophy, but also the Golden Rule Syndicate as it operated within the state of Montana. At least six different proprietors began their own chains throughout the state. And as they were successful in these towns, Penny did not think it would square with what was right and just to open J.C. Penny stores in competition with these merchants. If you also notice in the early part of the 20th century, particularly in the 1920s, Montana had a number of formidable retailers across the state. On the left-hand side, you may recognize the flagship department stores of Hennessy's and Uptown Butte, Hart Albin and Billings, Flegelman's and Helena. But on the right side, there are also a number of Montana-based retail chains that were formidable in their own right. Power Mercantile predated almost every retailer there. Frank Buttry had begun his department store chain out of Great Falls long before he would be made famous by his later development, the grocery store. And Vaughn and Ragsdale operated out seven stores out of Columbus in cities as small as Absorkey and as large as Billings. So I think Penny felt that if he were to move into Montana at that point, somebody would get squeezed out, and he certainly didn't want it to be the Golden Rule merchants. However, the boom, if we can call it a boom of J.C. Penney stores across the state, came in the years 1927 to 1930, when every one of these Golden Rule merchants was ready to retire. They decided to approach James Cash Penny with the idea of him buying out their stores and integrating them into the J.C. Penney chain. And he was more than willing to do this. And as you can see, any of those stars with a yellow background were golden rule locations that Penny acquired from 1927 to 1930. This changed his number of locations statewide from merely five to almost 40. And in true golden rule fashion, he wanted to give the managers the opportunity to continue serving those communities within his company. So anybody who worked for these golden rule stores was able to stay on as a J.C. Penney manager. Typically, Penny would take the J.C. Penney manager and send them all the way to St. Paul, Minnesota to pick out a new inventory for the store. Then the manager would come back, they would clearance out everything that was Golden Rule merchandise, have a remodeling on the front of the store and in some cases the interior, and reopen it as a J.C. Penney department store. Sometimes these grand openings, even though they were essentially in the same building, were overwhelming. Within Bozeman, when the Golden Rule store reopened as a J.C. Penney store, the Chronicle estimated that 10,000 people inundated the store from open to close. It was so crowded that the manager actually had to lock the front doors and let customers out through the alley before letting additional customers back inside. Now keep in mind that Bozeman had a population of under 10,000 at that time, so this store was not merely serving the city of Bozeman, but a region of shoppers as well, rural and urban. When they decided to open these stores, they came in a variety of shapes and sizes, largely based on what the community could bear. You can see this tiny location in Plentywood was barely 20 feet wide, as was this location in Beach, North Dakota. Penny preferred to lease stores rather than own them. It gave him the opportunity to create a better department store location as these communities potentially could grow. So in the case of Beach, it's very likely that Penny had options on the space next to it. Beach never topped 2,000 people, but if it had, Penny was willing and able to move into the space next door and create what he would call a double room location. In Glendive, Penny was not satisfied with the Golden Rule location that he had opened in, so he contracted the Dion family, and they erected a new J.C. Penney store built entirely to J.C. Penney specifications, which opened in 1929. 
You can see that there's still a plaque on this store, even though it's been gone as a JCPenney location for 30 years as part of the historical district of Merrill Avenue. But what was important is it gave customers in towns like Glendive a uniform store to shop at with all the departments clearly available and the ability to carry the inventory that Penny felt the community needed. Now, if you look in this store, it's very typical of the design of these Main Street stores throughout the United States. There's a wide sales floor, a high ceiling, and the trademark feature typically was this mezzanine merchandise balcony above the back with the left-hand staircase going up to it. If you look closely, you'll also see a series of cables running up and down from the main sales floor. As I mentioned, JCPenney was a cash-only operation, but there were, of course, perils in keeping a lot of cash on the main sales floor. So this system called the Lamps and Cash Conveyor allowed customers to come in, make their cash purchases. The clerk would write out what they were buying, take their money, put it in a container, and it would be spring-loaded up to the balcony where another clerk would finalize the receipt and send down any change due. What's fascinating about this system is Penny kept it in place all the way into the 1950s across Montana. And if you get a chance to go to downtown Sydney, the former Yellowstone Mercantile were, were using this system uh, relatively recently until the store permanently closed. The owners of that building have kept one of these uh, intact, so you can see that for yourself. But it was quite a system, and you can imagine what the atmosphere was like in cities like Great Falls, Butte, and Billings during the Christmas holiday se shopping season. Of course, Penny also paid close attention to improving locations in smaller towns, this being my hometown of Baker, Montana. Just as the Glendive location reopened in 1929, so did this one in Baker along Montana Avenue. Uh, this was a single room prototype, a smaller location that Penny, of course, would have options on possibly expanding as the city and the sales grew accordingly. I think it's important to notice the care that the JCPenney had, company had as they opened these stores. Looking at this store on the left in Harlowton, Montana, it sort of belies the population of that particular city, even at that particular time, in comparison to the storefront in downtown Bozeman. They were nearly the same size as each other. By the end of the 1920s, JCPenney had almost 1,400 stores nationwide, and his nickname had become the Main Street Merchant. But he was more than just a department store magnet. He felt that he wanted to stay in touch with his largely agrarian customer base. And so he began involving himself in agricultural and philanthropic activities. Here you can see him with one of his prize-winning Guernsey cows. But he was also well known, even into the 1950s, as a foremost black Angus breeder in northern Missouri, as well as a Hereford breeder in both Missouri and New York. Unfortunately, one of J.C. Penney's biggest mistakes came in October 1929, when he decided the time was right to take the J.C. Penney Company public. Six days after their IPO, the stock market crashed. And it was personally devastating for James Cash Penney in ways that I don't have time to get into for this presentation. But what I want you to know is that what he created was able to weather the Great Depression. Mile City and Phillipsburg unveiled new J.C. Penney stores in the midst of the Depression, and by 1934, sales nationwide had began to recover from their 1929 levels. In fact, across this entire chain of roughly 40 stores, there were only three casualties during the Great Depression. Smaller stores in Columbus, Townsend, and Whitehall were deemed unprofitable, and the company could not forecast profits in the future, so they were closed. But the rest of them survived well into the latter half of the 20th century. At the same time, James Cash Penny's partner, Earl Corder Sams, embarked the company on a new strategy beginning in 1931. <laughs> Typically, J.C. Penny had been a small town retailer, but Earl Sams saw opportunities in large metropolitan cities, such as this store in downtown Seattle on the corner of Second and Pike. It was unveiled in 1931, and despite having a cash-only policy, was the first J.C. Penney store to actually accrue more than a million dollars in sales its first year of operation. The total was actually $1.5 million during the Depression in 1931. Obviously, this was a future destiny for J.C. Penney locations from that point forward. Not only they, could they be located in farm towns of just a few hundred people, but now they could go into metropolitan cities of a million, still focusing primarily on downtown Main Street locations. 
Of course, though, the JCPenney company did not ignore the locations on which it had built its chain. And this was certain in Sydney in 1941 when the company unveiled this new location. As I told you before, JCPenney preferred to lease its stores, and they wanted to do this as an effort to involve the community itself in making it a better trade center. So the owner of this building was actually the F.T. Reynolds Company, which many of you in eastern Montana will recognize as a regional grocery store. F.T. Reynolds decided to build this, company, this store according to J.C. Penney specifications. And what's impressive about this location to me is not the fact that it's continued to operate as a J.C. Penney store 72 years since, meaning it's still in downtown Sydney today, but at the time of its opening in 1941, it was actually larger than the J.C. Penney locations in downtown Missoula, as well as Helena and Bozeman. In fact, when this store was unveiled in 1941, the only J.C. Penney locations statewide that were larger were in downtown Billings, Uptown Butte, and downtown Great Falls. So you can see the impact that a national department store like this would have for a town like Sydney, particularly in that pre-war era. As J.C. Penney progressed after World War II, we were dealing with customers who increasingly were able to pursue wants rather than just necessities and needs. And Penny felt the stores needed to upgrade. In addition, certain cities like Billings, Butte, and Great Falls were becoming in their own rights regional trading centers, and the stores needed to respond accordingly. So after World War II, this location in Uptown Butte was relocated to the corner of Park and Dakota, this store in downtown Billings was relocated directly across from its formidable competitor, Hart Albin. And the Great Falls store, where the Penny Brothers had originally unveiled their Golden Rule location, was again remodeled and expanded to the point of becoming the largest J.C. Penny store in the state at its original location on Central Avenue. Really, the high point for J.C. Penny was in the 50s. They had a solid chain of 36 stores in both Montana's largest cities and its small mining and agricultural towns. And you can see that Penny came back to Montana. He made a number of trips to the state by himself. The most notable was in 1933 during the Great Depression. This location, or this photograph was taken in 1951 in the shoe department of Billings. It's almost eerie in a way because as James Cash Penny is standing there, it looks like his reflection. It's actually his portrait behind there. But he was interested in where these stores were going in his larger cities. So he spent three days each in Butte, Great Falls, and Billings. And even though bad things happened to the Missoula store at the same time, they were able to come back and open another metropolitan location in that very same spot on South Higgins. And as these stores entered the 1950s, they were able to upgrade with, upgrade with amenities like air conditioning, escalators, and elevators. Talk to anybody who grew up in Missoula, Great Falls, and Billings, especially if they're a baby boomer, and they'll probably have a story about back to school shopping and riding the escalator. Of course, the smaller stores across the state also needed an upgrade. And in the 1950s, JCPenney was facing increased competition from Sears and Montgomery Ward. Now, we tend to think of these uh, as always having coexisted together. But what you have to understand is Sears and Wards did not get into the physical department store business until the late 1920s. And in the opposite aspects, J.C. Penney did not get into the catalog business until 1963. So the 50s increasingly saw a convergence of these national chains on Main Street. And of course, Hennessy's began to open branch locations and there were even local formidable stores, such as the Yellowstone Mercantile here in Sydney, that forced Penny's hand in making these stores modern for an emerging modern consumer. And this continued in locations like Malta, Miles City, and Glendive, where you had a flat, smooth storefront. The wooden doors were typically done away with. The interiors. This photo was circa 1941. You can see the hardwood, hardwood floors and roughly utilitarian fixtures as well as the antiquated lighting system. This is the Anaconda location in 1954 after an expansive remodel and sales floor expansion. Looking around that photo, you can see the uh, developments of fluorescent lighting, carpeted and tiled floors, modern, almost artistic fixtures that would model 
your gloves, your lingerie on a torso, as well as backlit directory signage to help customers navigate their way. What's important to notice about this is that the expansion to the Anaconda store involved constructing yet another sales floor above this one. So technically, the Anaconda location had four levels of shopping space by the end of 1954. By the late 1950s, downtown was still king for JCPenney locations. They decided to come back to Cut Bank with this new location in 1955, where it continues to operate to this day, as well as unveiling completely new locations in Libby, larger locations in Kalispell, and into the 60s, new locations for Laurel, Whitefish, and downtown Helena. Now what's interesting about this, as we continued to move into the post-war era of the 20th century, consumers were demanding more from a store. It wasn't enough for it to merely supply what they needed. And you can see by this ad when the Helena store opened, more space, more shopping convenience, more varied merchandise selection, your new bigger Helena pennies. Pennies was feeling the pressure of customers while still trying to maintain this Main Street chain of stores. And it was very difficult because you could only make a store so big. You can also see on the bottom that there's a line that says now you can charge it at your pennies. And this was something that was contentious for James Cash Penny, who was alive and well and still very much involved with his company. When the CEO, Mill Batten, approached him that in order to survive in the late 20th century, they needed to start offering charges, he made his case to James Cash Penny. And James Cash Penny said, I understand this will increase store sales. I understand that it will increase store profits. But I also feel that it's going to encourage people to live beyond their means and buy things they don't need. And for that reason, I have to vote no. Of course, he was the only no vote on the board and the motion carried, but it shows you that those convictions stayed with Penny all his life. Now, I had to make a, a shout out to Bob Dylan on the bottom of this 1960s Penny's logo. The times, they are a changing. And it really didn't have anything to do with the counterculture for the Penny's stores, but more of socioeconomic factors throughout the state that began to drastically change J.C. Penny stores as we know them. If the boom of the J.C. Penny Main Street department store was the 1920s, then I would tell you the bust would be a protracted period from about 1960 to 1990. And there were some reasons for that. There were fewer people working in agriculture, and this transition had increasingly happened in the 1950s. By the 1960s, many towns were losing population because of this. And with those population losses were reductions in the populations that supported the J.C. Penney store in those communities. In addition, the improvement of roads, not just in the four-lane interstate highway system, but two-lane blacktop highways, made it much easier for customers in the smaller town to go to the next larger trading center and do their business with the J.C. Penney store there. In addition, J.C. Penney was nearing the end of its leases on many of these single room stores, such as the one in Polson on the left and the one in Baker on the right. And the company had hard decisions to make. Could they afford to have a builder build a brand new location and lease that on a 20 year basis or longer? They had a prototype for that. And as late as 1959, they had done this in Hedinger, North Dakota. Unfortunately, most of these stores, they felt, were nearing the end of their existence. And the future of J.C. Penney stores, ironically, at the same time as these smaller downtown locations, were massive shopping mall prototypes such as this one. These carried far more than just additional merchandise that was typically found in a store like the one here in Sydney. They had complete automotive centers. They sold paint, hardware, shotguns, ammunition. Some of the metropolitan stores in suburban Denver even had horse tack. If there was a department to be sold, they wanted it in these stores. Many of them were between 200 to 300,000 square feet, some of them larger than the contemporary Walmart Supercenter. And almost all of them 200 times larger than the store James Cash Penny first opened in Kemmerer, Wyoming. Of course, as I mentioned, Kent Penny continued to be involved with his company, even into the early 1970s. He celebrated his 95th birthday in 1970, and he publicly hoped he would live to see 100. Unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. In February 1971, he peacefully died at the age of 95 in a New York City hospital. And after Penny's death, the company really started increasingly going a different direction. 
As you can see, these stores that began to suffer in the 1960s, marked by the blue squares, all were shut down between 1960 and 1972. And again, the next larger trade center would absorb that business. But there was another pressure that was also happening, and that was the rise of suburban shopping within the state of Montana. J.C. Penney stores had relatively been immune to this. In fact, if we even look at the five locations in Montana today where J.C. Penney operates in malls, those being Billings, Missoula, Butte, uh, Helena, and Great Falls, J.C. Penney resisted moving to those shopping centers when they were first built, preferring instead to remain operating out of downtown. But as the old saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. And in this case with Butte, this store was slated to be remodeled and expanded in uptown Butte as early as 1972. Now when we think about what that might have meant for Butte, you have to keep in mind that Burr's department store was still going at that time, as was Sears Ward's and a block up the street on Granite, the flagship store for Hennessy's. Unfortunately, an explosion occurred in the basement of this building, completely imploded the structure, and destroyed almost an entire city block. And after that, J.C. Penney could no longer see Uptown Butte as a viable location. And the first opportunity they had in 1975, they permanently left the Uptown Business District for South Harrison Avenue. You can see that this second phase of the Main Street bust then occurred from 1975 to 1990, when we had eight J.C. Penney stores on Main Streets throughout Montana, permanently leaving the Central Business District for a new shopping center. Conversely, by the late 1980s, the company itself began to accept that its true identity was as a suburban shopping mall anchor, not a Main Street department store. So they released a policy in early 1983 that stated, if the store was not in a mall, it should be relocated to one at its earliest convenience. If it looked like there wouldn't be a shopping mall ever constructed in that city, an intense analysis of its profitability would be conducted, and either the store would continue on or be permanently closed. As you can see, from 1985 to 1989, 10 J.C. Penney stores permanently closed in 10 towns and cities across the state of Montana. This trend continued for the next decade from 1990 to 2000, as longtime customers said goodbye to locations in Dillon, Anaconda, Wolf Point, Libby, Glasgow, and Mile City. And where we've really been for the last 13 years is this regional JCPenney mall stores that exist primi primarily in the western half of the state, as well as the two Main Street locations that operate in Cutbank and here in Sydney. Across the state and the nation, it's easy to walk into a mall parking lot or the inside of a shopping mall and assume that this is all JCPenney ever was, the suburban alternative to shopping at Macy's, Dillard's, Herberger's, even Target or Kohl's. But a trip just down the street gives us a different perspective of what JCPenney used to be. This store has operated in this location for 72 years, and it's served downtown Sydney in some capacity for almost 90. If you walk inside this store, you're going to find yourself standing on the sales floor of a store that sold merchandise to more than seven generations of Montana customers through cycles of boom as well as cycles of bust. Take a good look around the inside of this store, and you'll see all the architectural trimmings that James Cash Penny wanted his stores to have. And you might even feel a little bit of the spirit of retailing history, because this was JCPenney. Thank you.